What's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. First, I want to say happy new year to each and every one of you. Thank you for still being here with me on my channel through this past year, through all of the chaos and confusion and frustration and heartbreak. And I just could keep on listing adjectives for the year of 2020, but I'm not going to because I'm hoping that 2021 brings some sort of peace and solitude and happiness to all of us that I feel like we're all very deserving of after this past year. So before I jump into the case for today, I wanted to give you guys a really important update on a previous case that I covered. It was probably a couple of years ago at this point, and that is the case of Michaela Garrett. And this happened in 1988. She was kidnapped from the middle of a parking lot in Northern California. Um, I know there was a scooter left behind and that was pretty much it. No one really was sure what exactly happened to Michaela. There was no trace of her. Everyone expected remains to be you know, found somewhere. It was a really small town, so no one even expected something like this to happen anyways. And honestly, I feel like by the end of that video and in the comment section, no one was really sure if this was a case that was ever going to be solved. But here we are, right before Christmas, a 59-year-old man named David Emery Mish ended up being arrested and charged in connection with Michaela Garrett's, I think, disappearance and murder. I know that they lifted fingerprints off of the handlebars of her scooter that she was riding, and I believe shortly after her disappearance, two witnesses did pick him out of a line. I don't know if that was more recent. I'm pretty sure that was right after the um, kidnapping occurred, but he was someone that was on the radar for a while. And finally, they were able to conclusively say that his fingerprints matched those found on the scooter um, the day that Michaela Garrett was taken. So I know that right now he's in prison actually for the murder of another individual and also has charges for the murder of two other women. So we have a potential serial killer on our hands as well. I will definitely do an update video on this to give a lot more information. It seems like it goes pretty deep, so it might just kind of get its own video. We'll see how that goes. But I know that a lot of us are really invested in these cases and especially the ones that are older and have been sitting for a really long time. It's always great to see police officers, investigators, forensic teams still working on these cases to bring us these sorts of outcomes. Um, I know that the family is obviously struggling right now. Her mom has said that she kind of, at this point, had come to terms with the fact that her daughter was no longer alive. But once this happened and the reality hit that she was at this point picturing her child as dead, it wasn't just Mm, Michaela's not alive anymore. It was my young daughter that was kidnapped. My nine-year-old daughter was killed at the age of nine. Um, it was She's going through a lot. The whole family's going through a lot. This happened right before Christmas. So my thoughts and prayers are going straight out to Michaela's family and everybody involved. So now I'm going to get into the case for today, which is the very controversial and confusing disappearance of Rebecca Roosh. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. I do want to state that this is a German case and 99% of the articles and the research that I had to do, everything was in German. There is a podcast that recently was released that is all in German and I couldn't find a way to translate it. So I'm sure there is information that I'm missing. I am sure that there were probably translation errors along the way in this. It was very interesting. I've never really had to translate this much information before in a case. So a huge thank you to all of you guys that helped me out. A ton of you guys offered help on Instagram and I was able to have a few things cleared up through you guys. You're all absolutely awesome. But just keep that in mind while I am giving you this information. This is just the beginning. This is just the information I've gathered. Always take this and go and do your own research to form your own conclusions and opinions. So this is a very controversial and widely spoken and known about case in Germany. And it was a very interesting case for me personally, because this is the first time where I've looked into a case and so many things are different than I'm used to. It seems like Germany handles missing persons cases very different than anywhere else that I've seen so far. And I think it's because missing persons cases or at least unsolved cases aren't 
as common in Germany. They're not like few, few and far between. They still happen, but it's just at a very different rate than most areas of the world. So I feel like a lot of things are kept a lot more hush hush. So authorities don't typically hand over pretty much any information at all. Even with families, usually everything is kept very tight to the vest. They don't speak a lot with media. The families don't speak a lot with media. The families usually don't even reach out on social media, on their own platforms. But Rebecca's case blew blew all of that out of the water. It was the most Googled search term in 2019 in Germany. So everyone ever knew about this case, which is almost why it's so frustrating to me that it hasn't been solved and kind of makes the controversy around it that much more. The main suspect in this case it's very controversial the way the families handled the disappearance and spoken a lot to the media. That's been very controversial. Um, the way authorities have kind of put blinders on is controversial. The, the relationship between the police officers and the family, that's controversial. So basically I'm laying all of this out and you can form your own opinions on what you think because it just seems very much like tug of war in this case. So we'll start with Rebecca. Rebecca was only 15 years old and she was your typical teenager all the way through. She was known to be very kind. She had a lot of friends, but she was still very shy. She kind of kept to herself uh, and she was really close to her family, especially her two sisters that she had. And one main thing is that she always kept in really great communication with her family. So it seems like there was a pretty good family relationship going on. In her free time, she did what I feel like every teenager these days does. She spent a lot of time on WhatsApp. Um, from what I'm seeing in Germany, a lot of the different phone plans don't come with texting. Um, I've also seen that obviously Apple isn't the biggest brand used over there for cell phone services. So there is no iMessaging. So WhatsApp is kind of what everyone gravitates towards. She also spent a ton of time on Snapchat and she absolutely loved making TikToks because at this point who doesn't? And one of her biggest joys in life was BTS. She loved BTS and their music and she spent all of her extra time dancing to their music in her room or making TikToks to their music. So on the 17th of February, 2019, this was a Sunday, Rebecca decided she was going to go over to her 27 year old sister, Jessica, and her brother-in-law Florian's house to stay. They lived in the exact same neighborhood that Rebecca lived in with their parents. So it was really easy for her to kind of go back and forth. And from what I saw, it was very common for her to spend weekends over at her sister's house. She loved to hang out with her sister. She loved to hang out with her niece. So this was a very common occurrence, but on this particular Sunday, she had, I guess, kind of come to an agreement with her mom that she would spend the night there, which I don't believe she typically did on school days. I could be wrong, but she was going to stay there that night as long as she made it to school the next morning on time. That was the one thing that her mom asked her to do. So on the following morning, which was the 18th, the Monday, it was around 5.45 in the morning, and at this point, Florian was just arriving home. He had been out at a company party all night long, so he was just getting in, and then at around 7 a.m., so a little over an hour after that, Jessica was heading out for the morning. She grabbed her daughter, she was gonna take her to daycare, and I believe Jessica was heading into work. So at this point, it would have only been Florian and Rebecca in the home. Shortly after Jessica left the home, just around seven, um, I think it had to have been probably within minutes, Rebecca's mom started to try to get in contact with Rebecca because she wanted to make sure she was awake. She was actually following the directions her mom gave her and she was getting ready to go to school. But Rebecca's mom was not able to contact her. I believe she called her a handful of times and it was just going straight to voicemail. So she was probably worried that Rebecca's phone had died. She hadn't charged it overnight. So she decided to call Jessica and have Jessica make sure Rebecca was up. But Jessica had already left. So she then called Florian to tell Florian to make sure that Rebecca Rebecca was up. But Florian said at 7.15, when the phone call between him and his wife occurred, that Rebecca was not in the living room, sleeping on the couch where she had been the night before. And so they assumed she had already gotten up, been dressed and headed off to school. Now this, in my opinion, 
was already odd right off the bat because Rebecca didn't have to be at school until 9.50. So we're talking about a three hour gap time frame. And I know that she took the bus. She had to walk to her bus stop from the house. I don't believe it was very far at all. And she took the bus there to school. And also from my understanding, it wasn't like a typical school bus. She just took like a city bus, public transportation. But still, I don't know if that would have taken that full three hours for her to get to school. It just seemed a little bit off. And then even more so, it was strange because Jessica never states if she saw Rebecca that morning. So that would mean, you know, if she had seen Rebecca as she left, then Rebecca had 15 minutes to basically get up silently, get dressed and leave without anyone noticing. And if Jessica hadn't seen her that morning, it kind of makes you question, well, how early did Rebecca leave? Did Rebecca leave in the middle of the night? It just kind of makes the timeline very questionable, I guess you could say. But at this point, still nobody was really thinking the worst. They were just assuming her phone died. She was already headed to school. She'll charge it. She'll get in contact with someone. At around 8.25, however, and Becca's mom decided to call Florian's home herself. The first time that she called, Florian didn't answer and it took a couple of minutes for him to call back and he was like, yeah, um, you know, I already told Jessica pretty much Rebecca already left for school. So at this point, again, no one's concerned. They're just thinking she already left. Then 20 minutes later, Rebecca's mom really was still wanted to get in contact with her. So it was about 8.42 in the morning at this point and she sent Rebecca a WhatsApp message um, in hopes of getting in touch with her, kind of getting her attention. And still she received no response. Now at this point, the message was delivered and not read. And those of you that follow me on Instagram are probably laughing right now because I have no, I don't know anything about WhatsApp. I don't know a single thing about it. I have like 83 unread text messages on my phone. I would rather be sent like a letter or spoken to in person. So I am not very up to date on a lot of these things. And apparently, if this message was delivered but not read, that would indicate that Rebecca's phone at the time was in fact on and it was connected to the internet. She just didn't open it. Now I've seen that you can change the feature to where it doesn't show if you opened it or not. I don't know if she had that on, but I'm assuming since her mother very specifically stated it was not read that she had the feature turned on. Um, and for some reason, she just never looked into it. But keep in mind, that means her phone was on at 8.42 in the morning. Everyone was still just keeping positive until later that night when Rebecca never showed up at home and the school also called the family to inform them that she hadn't ever shown up for school either. And at this point, this is incredibly unlike Rebecca. She loved her family. She was always very responsive to them. She was a responsible young woman. She was very particular about keeping in touch with them. So they immediately went to the police station to report Rebecca as missing. Now I have seen a few different pieces of information in regards to authorities' reaction to this missing persons report. Um, I've seen a few articles state that they didn't take it seriously, that they just said, she's a teenager, she's 15 years old, like she'll come home, teenagers sometimes get mad, or they wanna go hang out with boys, or do whatever teenagers do, she'll come back, and it took them a couple of days to react. I've also seen that they immediately started searching, so again, translation issues, I'm assuming. Um, if anyone is from Germany and is very familiar with the story, please feel free to leave any information you have with a linked source down below. But either way, when authorities did start searching, they immediately went to Jessica and Florian's house because this was the last place that Rebecca was known to be. And they wanted to see if there was any sign in the home that something either happened or any indication on where she might've gone or what her plans may have been that morning. And they also released a photo to the media right off the bat as well to alert everyone to her disappearance and hopefully have people searching for her. But this kind of started the first of many issues between the police and the family. The photo that was released by police looked nothing like Rebecca. It was very heavily edited, um, very heavily filtered, and according to her family, if someone was out there looking for that girl, that specific girl in the picture, they weren't going to find her because in reality, Rebecca looked nothing like that. And they were very upset with authorities for releasing that particular photo. They said that they gave authorities a whole 
collection of pictures to choose from, um, you know, of Rebecca without makeup, of Rebecca with makeup, but not super filtered. And they were really pissed off, basically, that authorities chose that particular one. But authorities said they just chose what they could to get it out there as fast as possible. They even stated that the family specifically asked them to use that. No one's really sure what happened, but it basically caused a big issue right off the bat. And that could harm the case severely. If the picture they released is not what she actually looked like, there's no telling how many people could have possibly seen Rebecca out and just not recognized her. But the search went on nevertheless. It was noticed that Rebecca left with a handful of things. She left with a Vans backpack, I'm unsure of the color, a fuzzy pink jacket, like a zip up jacket, a pink or purple, I've seen both when I look at the photo of what they're saying, it looks like it looks purple to me, um, but a pink or purple fleece blanket, her cell phone as well as a Polaroid camera and a BTS t-shirt. No other personal items were taken. I'm unsure if she had a phone charger with her and we know for a fact that she did not go back home to grab any other items either. She basically just left with what she had taken over to her sister's house. I don't think she left anything there, but that wasn't directly stated at all. Authorities announced that in the initial search of Jessica and Florian's home that they had not found any sign of foul play or any sign of a struggle within the home, but after a few more searches and a couple of days on the 23rd of February, authorities announced that they were reclassifying the case from a missing persons case to a homicide. So that's kind of a big jump. Again, authorities keep a lot to themselves, but it, it seemed like they went from there's no sign that anything happened within the home to all of a sudden, yep, she absolutely was killed. They stated that they had a handful of reasons why they came to this decision. First and foremost, her phone had connected to the router in the home between 6 and 8 a.m. And that is a very broad time frame, but through looking through a couple of other articles, I've managed to see a more specific time of 7.46 a.m. She apparently at 7.46 a.m. was in the home connected to the router and she was on WhatsApp specifically. And that is when she sent her last form of communication to anyone. And she sent it in the form of a selfie. I've also seen that she she sent a voice memo to someone through WhatsApp, but that those are deleted. And I don't know if they ever were able to get into that, or I don't know if that was just, again, a translation error, but I know for a fact she did send a selfie and it was of her fully dressed, even with her jacket on as if she was ready to leave the home. And the person who received this message from Rebecca remembered thinking it was really, really early for her to be ready. And I already spoke about that earlier on in the video that she didn't have to be at school until 9.50. His friend also immediately messaged Rebecca back and received no response. Authorities also stated that her behavior prior to her disappearance did not indicate that she was planning on running away or, you know, possibly ending her life, mainly because she didn't take a lot of personal belongings with her. She basically took what she would have taken to school every day. Um, I don't know if it was common for her to take her camera or, you know, this blanket or things like that, but... Her friends and family did eventually say that despite authorities stating this, that she apparently wasn't very happy prior to her disappearance, but I will get into that a little bit later on in the video. Within a few days on the 27th of February, authorities decided to check the entire route that Rebecca would have taken from Jessica and Florian's house to the bus stop and then from the bus stop to the school to see if there were any signs along that way that she potentially was kidnapped or attacked, if they could maybe see if they could find any of her belongings, but unfortunately they didn't find anything. I do know that they brought in dogs with them and the dogs did pick up a scent that indicated Rebecca left the house and went to the bus stop, but then the scent went away by the time they reached the bus stop. Um, indicating she got on at least that's what it seems like but then where on earth did she go after that we know she didn't make it to school so what could have possibly happened to her i personally wonder if there was any cctv on the bus i know that's a common thing for a lot of public transportation to have um, if it wasn't public transportation it was an actual school bus then you would assume friends on the bus recognized her uh, so I wonder if any of that was really looked into. Then on the 28th of February, a day after this search occurred, Florian was unexpectedly arrested in connection with Rebecca's disappearance. And I'm very curious to see if any of you guys from the start of this video till now 
kind of thought that was going to happen, what your own conclusions were. Authorities said they had many reasons to believe that Florian was potentially involved in Rebecca's disappearance, most of them in relation to his contradictions and constantly changing stories. Florian had told authorities what I kind of already spoke about before, that he had been at a company party the night before. I think it was actually a Christmas party. So he got home at 5.45 in the morning, but he also told authorities that he immediately went to sleep because he was exhausted, which makes sense, except authorities looked into the router and the router showed that his phone was connected to the router after he got home um, for a good period of time and he was messaging people and he was browsing websites. So that indicated he didn't at all go to sleep like he said he did. And the thing that was a little bit more alarming is the fact that Florian's phone was connected to the router and in use at the same time that Rebecca's phone was connected to the home router and in use. So that meant that both Rebecca and Florian were in the home together awake at the same time yet somehow he didn't have any idea that she was there. And this means that, you know, when Florian said that she had left at 7.15 to his wife on the phone, that meant that Rebecca was still there. And maybe there's a chance that she was just in a different room. Maybe she was in the bathroom getting ready. Maybe he just walked out of his room real quick didn't notice her and went back inside. I personally wonder if he maybe still was under the influence or if he had been under the influence because of the party he was at. Um, maybe that had something to do with him missing her. I'm not sure how plausible any of that is. I don't know the layout of the home. I don't know what happened at the party, um, but basically, he was there with her for an extended period of time. He, you know, was awake from the time he got home at 545 until the time she left at 746, or at least that was the last time she was connected to the Wi-Fi at the home. They were there together that entire time. So I kind of find it hard to believe that he didn't know she was there. And this obviously made authorities question a lot. So they decided to conduct another search while he was in custody on March 1st to see if there was anything else that they could find within the home. And they apparently didn't find anything. So Florian had to be released. But this whole arrest, the searches, the accusations, the contradictions caused a lot of shock, confusion and controversy, as I'm sure you would expect. When Florian was arrested, I think all of the public kind of assumed that the family would react a very certain way, but they acted opposite of what people expected. The family stood by Florian 100%. They made it very clear that Florian never would hurt anyone in their family, that there was no way he ever would have hurt Rebecca. There wasn't a single person in the family that thought he was capable of doing anything to her or believed that he was involved. And they started to um, take on interviews and speak to the media and post on their own social media to encourage people to understand the Florian that they said that they knew would never do this. And they were very upset that this was happening. And they said that the authorities basically put on blinders the second they walked into this, that they couldn't find any indication anything else had happened. And they basically were ignoring any other possibilities that were being handed to them because they were so set on Florian. Meanwhile, authorities were still trying to dig up information on Florian to link him to her disappearance, even though he had at this point been released, but he wasn't released for very long because this ended up leading to his second arrest on March 4th, 2019, just days after his first one. And this was, I believe they used um, urgent suspicion of homicide as their way of being able to arrest him. Authorities had found that Florian's car had been detected on a plate reading device on the A12 two times shortly after Rebecca's disappearance. The first time was actually the morning of her disappearance at 1047 in the morning. He had a raspberry colored Twingo, so it was like a very recognizable car. That was literally a time where he also told authorities that he was sleeping. And then it was seen again the following night at I believe 1039 PM, so late at night. And both times he seemed to be heading into Poland. And it seemed like he was heading to the same place both of those times. Now, first of all, this is an issue because it's just a little bit suspicious, the timing of everything, but also 
He didn't mention either of these trips to authorities any of the times he had been interviewed so far. So that clearly makes the trips look suspicious. Why would you not want to tell authorities about it? Why are you hiding it? So I can see how authorities were questioning what was going on here. The car was in fact both owned and I believe used by both Florian and Jessica, but authorities were able to prove that Florian was the only one at both of those times that had access to the car. This caused so much of an uproar. Now everyone's thinking, okay, this is the second time that this man has been arrested. He already was arrested the first time because he had very contradictory and suspicious information. He was the last one known to be in the house with Rebecca. He said he was asleep, but he was actually awake. And now also while he was asleep, he took a trip all the way into Poland. You know, what is he doing here? And to top it off, Rebecca's family was doing a lot of interviews at this time as well. And they blatantly were saying that they knew those trips were not in relation to Rebecca's disappearance, that he was doing something else and that Rebecca was not involved. And they were like being very evasive about this the same way that Florian was being. And so everyone was like, what on earth are these people hiding? Because his, his because her family was also saying like, he needs to come out and tell the truth. So people are like, what is happening here? It was all very suspicious. And I think this has a lot to do with why this case ended up being the way that it is because everything from start to finish felt like you were in the twilight zone. With the information about Florian's car being seen at twice, getting off of the A12, heading towards Poland, plus the fact that he owned a very recognizable car, authorities decided to put out this information and tips began to pour in. Many of them stated that Florian's car was seen in the area of, and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, Rieplos, Rieplos, Brandenburg. Um, but this is a large forest area. It's 20 square miles of forest. And when tons of tips started coming in that he was seen by this remote forest, authorities are immediately thinking disposal of a body. So they decided to launch a massive search in this area. They had over 20 homicide detectives. They brought in tons of cadaver dogs and they took to the forest to methodically search. And unfortunately they weren't able to find anything. The only thing that they found were a set of tire tracks that they believed were suspicious. I saw that they did take a cast of the tire tracks, but then after that, everything was called off. Now, something I want to note as interesting, and maybe I just didn't find it in my search, but we know that they, we know that they had his car, Florian's car, and we know that they had these suspicious tire tracks, but they have yet to state if those tire tracks belong to Florian's car or not. Um, and typically when they don't come out and immediately rule things out, there's, in my opinion, a chance that they're not doing that for a reason because it is a match. Now I could be totally off base with this, so take that with a grain of salt, but I just find it very interesting that they've not come out that I've seen and said which way it goes. So after this search, they decided to change their location to Wolziger Lake in Brandenburg. Again, probably way pronouncing that wrong. YouTube and Google didn't help me out with a lot of these German pronunciations. I apologize um, if I'm saying it terribly, but this was apparently another lake that was surrounded by a forest that was very, very close to where uh, Florian got off at the exit. And it was just a few miles away from the original forest that they were searching. When they were at this lake, they used boats, they used cadaver dogs, they brought in thermal cameras, pretty much everything that you could potentially bring in to locate either remains or you know any sort of evidence they brought it in and unfortunately they still came up empty-handed so from there they went to search lake herzberg which was i think it was like a 10 minute drive away from wolfziger lake and they searched you know this lake as well as the forest surrounding there as well and they again found nothing but at this point they're searching all of the major lakes in that area where he got off the highway all of the major forests in that area because they are getting so many tips saying that his car was seen in this location now while all of these searches were occurring authorities were still working on florian trying to crack him he was still in custody at the time and he ended up confessing to something, but it had nothing to do that we know of with Rebecca's disappearance. He stated that the reason he didn't tell authorities about the trip he made early that morning, the morning of Rebecca's disappearance, is because he was worried he was going to end up with charges. Apparently, this trip was a drug deal, and he was worried that he was gonna end up with drug trafficking charges, borders had been crossed, 
um, and he was terrified and he had spoken to the family about this. He made them aware that he had made this trip early in the morning so they wouldn't think that he had any sort of involvement. So he cleared the air with them, but he obviously was very worried about repercussions for telling authorities. Now this is totally plausible and this also explains why the family was so evasive as well. They wanted him to just tell the truth about it. But while this is still totally possible, his reasoning behind the second trip is what made authorities think it could just be a crock of BS. So from a few different sources that I saw, and I do want to make it clear that I did not see this across every source. Um, this is apparently something that was found and released on the new podcast um, in regards to this case that I will speak about towards the end of the video. But again, I don't speak German, so <laughs> I can't listen to it. Um, but Apparently, the reasoning for his second trip at 10.39 p.m. the following night was because he was going back to search for his wedding ring. I can totally see why authorities think that's not the truth. First of all, authorities said if he was simply going on a drug deal early that Monday morning, how on earth did he lose his ring? And also, if he lost his ring, how did he not notice it until the following day? And then why did he decide to go back at night, late at night, to go and find it. They believe the only plausible way he could have lost his wedding ring is if he had been in the process of using his hands a lot or disposing of a body. So basically, while they almost ruled Florian out, they already didn't have a ton of evidence against him to begin with. Now they're kind of back to square one to thinking everything he is saying is suspicious and he's just kind of basically building on his lies. Meanwhile, the family was still attempting to get Florian's name out of the media. They decided to go forward with a bunch of different theories that they believe could possibly have be going on. And they really thought authorities were ignoring all of these possibilities. Rebecca's mom stated that she had an online friend that she had just recently met. And it was through one of her popular Instagrams. From my understanding, she had two separate Instagrams. And one of them was like a large, more like public figure Instagram. I think she had around 30 to 40,000 followers. And she met this guy on there named Max. Her family apparently went to authorities about Max right away. So this was someone that she obviously had been speaking to her family about. But Max was someone that was not from Berlin. As far as everyone knew, he was around her age and he apparently wanted to meet her in person. A lot of her friends have come forward saying that they were aware of Max, but they didn't personally know him. There was one friend in particular that stated that she saw a few messages between Rebecca and Max, and she even saw a picture of him, and he appeared to be someone their age with dark brown hair. And this friend also said that she was aware Max wanted to meet Rebecca. He really wanted to meet her in person. So he was going to come from wherever he was from down to Berlin to meet her. But Rebecca decided against it because it was apparently a last minute plan. I'm assuming she maybe didn't feel comfortable with it or just was nervous. I'm not sure which. She was very shy, so that might have had something to do with it. Rebecca's mom wonders if maybe that's what happened that day. If maybe she decided to last minute go and meet him and skip school and maybe something happened along the way. Maybe he wasn't who he said he was and maybe he was grooming her. This is social media, this is Instagram. And as someone who has like the same amount of following as she seemed to have had on her Instagram page, it's totally possible. <laughs> you guys, the amount of catfishing people that are in my DMs daily, it's a very, very common occurrence. And if you are a younger individual and you don't know the ways to kind of pick out the people that aren't necessarily who they say they are, you know, there's kind of red flags where you can see that there's something wrong. If you don't know what those are and you are younger, it's very, very easy to fall for them. I think it's very possible this is something that happened, that maybe she was groomed and then convinced to meet up with someone that she believed to be Max and instead was kidnapped. And while that's already such a huge possibility in itself, a reason why the family and even her friends believe this was even more of a possibility is because two days after Rebecca disappeared, when I don't believe, you know, if the timeline's right that authorities didn't act for a couple of days, then that means that at this point, nothing had been released to the media, only close friends and family knew about her disappearance. It was not something that was circulating everywhere. 
Two days after her disappearance, Max suddenly vanishes off of all social media. He's deleted all of his platforms. You can't find him through any of her social medias. I don't know who noticed it. I don't know if it was her family or if it was her friends who noticed it, um, but he's suddenly gone. And that's either a hell of a coincidence or a very, very serious red flag. Now this made authorities very unhappy. The fact that the family was going forward to the media, giving them all of this information, telling them the things that they believed could be happening, and basically saying authorities were ignoring everything. They seemed mad because they didn't want any alternate theories other than Florian being responsible released to the public. So they made their own statement in response to the family, to the media, basically saying that the family needed to stop speaking to the media, that they were going to compromise the investigation, that it was, you know, them that was slowing things down and basically destroying the investigation. And they also said that they had already checked into Max and all of these different theories that the family was bringing up and they had all been ruled out. So this is just another time where the family and authorities are butting heads big time. At this point, authorities still were holding Florian, but they didn't have enough to keep him in jail. They just didn't have the physical evidence they needed to charge him, so they ended up having to release him yet again. There had been forensics run on Florian's car as well as Jessica's. As we know, they already checked the whole house. Both of the cars were swept through for evidence and authorities had found some questionable things in Florian's car, the raspberry colored Twingo. So apparently in the car, I believe in the trunk, were Rebecca's hairs, or at least hairs thought to be Rebecca's and fibers as well from a blanket that may also resemble the blanket that Rebecca had that day. So everything was sent in and it ended up coming back that the hairs were seen, I've seen they were undetermined, which basically means they couldn't figure out if they were Rebecca's or if they weren't, but I have seen other coverage of this case state that they were found to not belong to Rebecca. Um, I've also not seen if they ever released if the fibers belong to the same blanket that Rebecca had. So basically evidence that they could have that could maybe indicate something was going on potentially still seemed to be very up in the air. And Rebecca's father even came forward when information about these two bits of evidence came out and he was able to explain both of them. He said that Rebecca was there the day before she disappeared that Sunday, we already know that, and she was spending time playing with her niece and they were playing kind of in and out of the car. And he said, it's very possible that during this, that a hair of hers could have fallen out or she maybe had a fiber on her from her blanket or they put the blanket in the car. And unfortunately, I feel like this is a situation where because she was with her family so much and she was over at her sister's that even if all of that had been found to belong to Rebecca, that still is just circumstantial evidence because it's still just as likely that she just was in the car. Um, so it's, it's again, one of these really tricky, slippery slopes. At this point, authorities came out and stated that they had evidence proving that there was a homicide that occurred within the home and that they knew for a fact that Rebecca did not leave that home alive and that instead she was killed within the home by specifically a male. They have not come forward with any of the evidence that they say that they have to prove this. Granted, they don't have to. They have every right to protect a case to you know make sure the integrity is upheld it just is really frustrating to the family and the public because either florian's out there and they have all this evidence that he's a killer and they're just not charging him and he could potentially hurt someone else or they're just saying this to try to keep along with a narrative that they want everyone to believe so you can see why everyone's just kind of freaking out in this case from every angle possible and i have seen authorities state that the only thing really holding them back is the fact that they don't have a body because it doesn't matter how much evidence you really have a lot of the time, it is very difficult to charge and convict someone and send it someone that, you know, for murder when there's not a body present. It isn't impossible, we've seen it, I've talked about it in a few cases that I've covered, it's just very, very difficult. And the last thing investigators and prosecutors want to do is charge someone that they strongly believe is responsible for murder and not get a conviction. That's like every prosecutor's worst nightmare. So you don't wanna kill her walking the streets, you just don't. So I can see maybe, maybe that has something to do with it and they just wanna keep everything else quiet because the family seems to put so much out there and they don't want anything compromised. But again, 
who knows? That was the very last time that Florian was arrested in regards to Rebecca's disappearance, but authorities to this day still say he is the prime suspect in the case. I know that Florian's family, I think his sister specifically, has spoken to the new podcast, which is called In the Dark, the Rebecca Rouge case. Again, it is fully in German. I cannot find their transcripts anywhere online to translate to English. I couldn't find any English version of it, period. And also, I believe you can get episodes one through four across most podcasting platforms, but I think from there on, they're only on Podimo, I believe is how it's pronounced. Um, and that's kind of like an exclusive, you pay for it monthly to get the podcast situation. So that's just for those of you interested. Um, but from what I'm seeing in the articles that are reporting on this podcast, those I am able to translate, it seems like his family is trying really hard to clear all of their names. They, they're basically saying that everyone believes he's responsible. And because of that, anyone with the same last name or in connection with him is being seen as monsters and that it's really affecting their lives. And Rebecca's family also has kind of been very, very adamant standing by his side that he is not responsible whatsoever, that he is an innocent man. But I will say they've taken a pretty large break from social media. So I don't think it's as apparent how their feelings and thoughts are right now. Um, just them speaking to the media seemed to cause a lot of issues and they started getting a lot of hate because they did stand beside Florian and because a lot of people in Germany didn't agree that they went to the media to begin with because they like to keep things more private in Germany. So they just kind of did the best they could to dial everything back and just, just kind of stay within their own social media. Now, there have been a lot of things made clear by the family on social media since then that point to other possibilities that Rebecca did in fact leave the house that day, again, kind of pointing that authorities did not investigate things from all angles. And also they've come forward with more information about the fact that Rebecca was kind of struggling prior to her disappearance, which could again open up a few different pathways in this case. First of all, when it came to her mental state, Rebecca's friends and family said that at the time she was surrounded by a very, very toxic group of friends. She had really good friends, but there was just this one group that she couldn't shake and she was actually about to move schools because of it. Now, I don't even think they were her friends from what I'm seeing. It just seemed like people that were bullying her um, or people that were really bringing her down. Apparently she had just gotten into an argument with someone prior to her disappearance. I think it was this guy. He was trying to pull a hat off of her head and instead scratched her and it caused this big scene. I know that authorities actually pulled this kid out of class a couple of times to question him and even Rebecca's mom showed up to school about it. And from what I'm seeing, it was all just kind of a misunderstanding and that's according to Rebecca's mom and and that's according to Rebecca's mom and her friends that it seemed like something bigger than it was, but still she seemed to have a lot of issues in school with certain individuals and these toxic friends were just that. They were really bad people. And she'd also been expressing concerns um, to her friends through WhatsApp as well, her closer friends. She said that she didn't like the life cycle. These are the kind of conversations she was having before disappearing. She said, and this is a quote, and I'm not sure if it's a quote from the friend from the podcast, again, translation issues, or if it's from Rebecca, I think it's more likely that this is maybe a friend reading the message or just a friend relaying what she said, but it says you become something and then do it for a lifetime. And then you die, you go to school, work, and then you're too old to live. That's kind of heavy, you guys. That's really, really heavy. And when her friends told her that they were worried about her, she explained to them that she had no drive. She said that she had no energy, that she had no urge to do anything. She didn't want to get out of bed. She didn't want to hang out with her friends. Her friend said that she would basically invite them over to her house where she didn't have to get out of bed, that they could just come and be with her. Um, and she said that she was doing this all because she felt empty, that most people had this purpose in life that they were you know, striving toward, that they felt like they had a calling and they got so much joy out of that calling. And she said she didn't have that with anything, that the only time she ever got excited about anything was when she was drunk. And then when she wasn't drunk, it would go away. So clearly 
Rebecca was struggling. There was something going on here. This makes you wonder if she maybe ran away because she was unhappy. She didn't wanna be stuck in the rat race of life. She was feeling very overwhelmed by it. Graduation was coming and she had all these expectations of her. And even if that's not something anyone was directly putting on her, um, she was putting those expectations on herself, it seems, and that was a lot. That's a lot to deal with, being stuck in your head with your own expectations. As someone who struggles with that, quite literally on a daily basis, it will drown you. Did that maybe push her to take her own life or maybe she was speaking to Max and did decide to go and meet him and maybe he disappeared off social media because they both decided to disappear together. Um, you know, I don't know the extent of which authorities actually checked out this Max guy. You know, it's really frustrating to not be able to trust that authorities thoroughly checked into something. And unfortunately, that's the feel that I get from this case. That uh, They say that they did, but I just don't know if I trust that. The reason why I think that is such a huge possibility that she may be left to go and see Max and hope to run off with him is because she got ready so early that day. It makes me wonder if she had plans early that morning. Um, she wanted to look nice. Maybe that's why she brought the camera. She wanted to document memories of being with him. And either A, they decided to run off together, or B, he was someone that she didn't expect and groomed her and she was kidnapped. No matter what, according to what has been said by her friends, she was in a very vulnerable state. It comes to witnesses, there's also quite a few interesting ones. And again, it's hard to say if authorities actually were able to check these out or not. So Rebecca was apparently seen by a neighbor that morning, the same day she was thought to have disappeared at around 11.30 a.m. Now, first of all, that would mean that she was at the house for an extended period of time or she left the house and maybe came back. It also would indicate that Florian probably had nothing to do with anything because at 10.40 something that morning, he was seen heading into Poland. So this kind of puts them in separate places. And the neighbor remembered seeing Rebecca walking down the road in the neighborhood and she had a, her blanket over her arm. And the neighbor remembered, you know, waving at her, saying hello, trying to greet her. And they said she looked up and just seemed angry, like upset, sad, just very negative emotions. She had a smug look on her face. And they also remembered, you know, that kind of got their attention, but also they were like, why does this girl have like a blanket when she's walking down the road? They thought maybe she was going to have a picnic, but then it had just rained. So why would she be having a picnic? Um, but it was just a very kind of strange occurrence. And this was someone in the neighborhood that from what I would assume probably had seen Rebecca before. Days later after Rebecca's photo was circulated in the news, this neighbor immediately called police to say, look, I saw her this particular day, the same day you're saying she went missing. I saw her at 11.30 in the morning. She was walking through the neighborhood. She told her whole entire story. So that was something that was reported to authorities, but authorities basically ignored it. Another girl also saw Rebecca at the bus stop that day. Now I've seen that this was actually in the evening. It wasn't in the morning. So this could just be a mix up of timelines or this means that she was in the area the entire day. But this girl also was not at all a stranger to Rebecca. This girl had done cheerleading with one of Rebecca's sisters. She knew the whole family. She knew Rebecca, knew what she looked like. And she remembered Rebecca standing behind her in line or she was standing behind Rebecca. It was one of those. And I've heard that she overheard Rebecca on the phone saying she wasn't getting on the bus. However, the only issue I have with that is that Rebecca didn't use her phone again after 7.46, I believe, in the morning that morning. Um, so either there was like a burner phone, which I don't think is super likely, or maybe the timing was a little bit off. I'm unsure. Was this maybe the voice memo that she had sent that morning? Um, I have no idea, but I wish I kind of had more information to understand this potential sighting. Now, as I said, the first woman, the neighbor reported this to authorities. This friend of Rebecca's family also reported this to authorities. And authorities told both of them, in a nutshell, that their sightings were not possible um, because she didn't leave the house alive basically and they believed there was someone else involved so she couldn't have been in either of those places at the times they were claiming and they asked no more questions they never contacted either of them again they washed their hands of it and moved on on the opposite side of the spectrum there also were more reports about potential sightings of florian's car um, and florian we already know there were tons of reports of his car being in the Brandenburg area that day, but there was one woman in particular that remembered seeing a suspicious man walking around that first forest that authorities initially searched. 
she had apparently gone out with her a group of her friends and they were going to go horseback riding in that area on the trails and i think her husband had to like encourage her to come forward about this later on but they remembered being on their horseback ride and they saw a man walking and he had his baseball cap on and he had it pulled like very very far down so you couldn't see his face and he was like looking around as if he was searching for something and then when he noticed that they were there he apparently took off running into the woods and they thought this was very strange but they just assumed it was someone acting just off and they went on about their day but then when they heard about you know the searches in the area and about Rebecca's disappearance apparently she called and reported this to authorities and she was able to prove not that he was there this man but that she was in fact there and what she was saying was true because she had a photo she had taken of her and her friends and the horses that was dated um the 18th the day that rebecca went missing she did in fact but she did state and made it very clear however that she wasn't at all stating this was Florian that she saw because none of them saw his face at all. His hat was pulled way too far down. Um, they also, I don't think, saw a car. So they wanted to say they, you know, were not accusing anyone of anything, but they did in fact witness some bizarre behavior there that day. Maybe it was possibly related. Now, I don't know if authorities have stated it could be related or if they haven't. I've just seen that this, you know, was something that occurred. Her mother also introduced a theory apart from all of this, that doesn't necessarily state what may have happened to her, but maybe could have put her in a position to where she was more vulnerable to being kidnapped or attacked. Rebecca, as Rebecca loved BTS, like I told you guys in the beginning, and the 18th is apparently one of the BTS members' birthdays. And her mom said she took her BTS shirt and her Polaroid camera, and she wondered if she was going out that day to maybe take pictures of herself to send to this BTS member um, as a happy birthday gift, I guess. Maybe that's why she got up so early. Maybe she did have plans to go to school, but she wanted to take these pictures beforehand. So she got up early and she got dressed and she was gonna go out and take pictures and then go to school. And maybe something happened along the way, um, but I don't know. I feel like that's kind of a big stretch of a theory, but again, just wanted to state it here. So there's all these kind of possibilities, but still authorities are pushing for Florian. There was a pretty famous German profiler that came in. His name is Axel Peterman, and he took a look into the case, and even he said that Florian, in his opinion, should be the main suspect. Um, but this was just an unprecedented scenario for Germany. I don't think anyone had really seen a young woman go missing like this, you know, in a very like silent, bizarre way. Um, and then they all watched as a suspect was taken into custody, put out of custody, back into custody, out, back in, out, like just repeatedly ping ponged into jail and out. And then all of the arguments between authorities and the family. Um, and a lot of people were just concerned. And this ended up making a trending hashtag, which is hashtag find Becky. That started to circulate in Germany. A lot of people were working very hard to spread her picture and her story to hopefully raise awareness. Um, I think this was just a very overwhelming situation for a lot of German residents. And it also triggered a huge conversation about how Germany needs to have some sort of alert system for missing persons because they don't have anything. And they wanted something similar to an Amber Alert in America. On April 16th, 2019, all searches were in fact called off for Rebecca. Um, but despite that, there has been activity, I guess you could say in the case, none of it seems very beneficial. Um, just kind of things that have happened that have ended up being ruled out. But apparently on March 31st, a photo was uploaded to numerous dating sites that resembled Rebecca. And I believe the family was sent this through social media and they ended up sending this to their lawyer and their lawyer ended up filing for an anthropological report. They wanted to use facial recognition to see if maybe this person in the photo was in fact Rebecca. Uh, but it ended up being found that it more than likely was not. I think the bridge of the nose was different. The distance between the tip of the nose and um, the upper lip was different. The size and shape of the teeth were different. Um, but there were a lot of people that strongly believed it was totally possible. And that kind of made people wonder if she had been put into sex trafficking. Um, there also was another alarm in May of this past year where there was an account made in the US, I believe it was like in Tennessee or something, it was something on the East Coast. And it used Rebecca's name, all of her pictures, and 
people wondered if maybe she had ran away and somehow managed to get to America, but it ended up just being basically a catfish. It was a scam, someone pretending to be her. And then on November 8th, just a few weeks ago, actually at this point, wow, it's late December. Just kidding, it's about to be January. I don't know what's happening anymore. Two months ago, <laughs> there were remains found um, in Berlin and they were being sent in to be analyzed. I know it was stated it was a possibility that they could have been Rebecca's, but they ended up being those of another missing young man in the area. Also were two teens that were walking around at Lake Wolzeiger and this was recently and they found a fleece blanket in the forest and everyone in Germany knows about the fleece blanket. So they immediately knew to call authorities and authorities did come out, pick up this blanket and they pretty quickly ruled it out as belonging to Rebecca. Um, I don't know if they just based that off of color alone or what exactly, there wasn't a lot of information on it. Now, most recently in the case, authorities have encouraged searches all the way to like Ukraine, Belarus, like all of those areas. They are questioning if maybe she did in fact leave the country despite not having a passport um, through trafficking, drugs, no one really knows. I don't know what their thought process is, but they are saying that they believe it's possible she left and they are very specifically looking for her cell phone in those areas. They have stated they believe her cell phone, if they find it, will hold a lot of answers in the case and help them solve it. And as I'm sure you're kind of making the assumption, they've also specifically stated they believe it contains information that proves Florian is in fact responsible for her disappearance and um, murder, basically. But let me know what you guys think down below. I know that this has been such a huge controversial case in Germany. Uh, it was very difficult to follow a lot of the information because it does seem like so much of it is just speculation and theories that were put out into the media um, and then authorities trying to keep it quiet. So I hope that I managed to get as much of this information correct as possible. If you found anything different or if you know anything different or if you speak German and you have information, please make sure to leave it down below, but don't just blindly state it. Please leave a link to it um, that can help people look into it and make sure what you're saying is correct. I do not like to spread bad information and that's why I don't do a lot of cases like this because it's so hard translating. So let me know what you guys think down below. Do you think it's possible that Florian is involved or maybe was he just involved in this whole drug deal situation and kind of like, it happened bad, bad timing, if that makes sense. Like his involvement with that then made him look suspicious in something else when in reality they had nothing to do with one another. Other than that, do you believe that it's possible she did leave that morning? There are so many people that seem to witness her leave and it wasn't just strangers. It seemed to be people that recognized her, knew her, or at least she could have seen before in the neighborhood. Um, the one thing that I do find strange is I think their timing is weird. So I don't know if maybe just their timing is off and they saw this earlier in the day. I have no idea where I stand on this case. Um, I just think it is very, very odd. The Max character is also odd to me that two days after she disappears, before he would probably even know anything, he randomly just deletes himself off of all of social media. That's very suspicious to me and honestly does scream you know, a grooming situation. Um, I really hope her family gets some answers. She was only 15 years old. It's going to be devastating no matter what the outcome is in this case, I feel like. Um, so hopefully you guys will keep her family and your thoughts, um, especially with going into yet another new year for them. They had to go into 2020 without their daughter and now they're going into 2021 without their daughter. So hopefully some answers come forward soon. I hope authorities aren't just putting blinders on and maybe something, you know, is looked into deeper. But that is all that I have today for you guys in regards to this case. But I do want to quickly remind you to please check out my podcast that I co-host with John Lorden, Crime After Crime. Every time I bring it up, on Instagram or on here. I have so many of you guys are like, wait a minute, you have a podcast? I had no idea. And I feel like it's just because I don't promote it a lot um, and neither does John. It's like our fun little side project. It's a really awesome podcast. And I know I may just be biased because I created it with John, but it really is. We spent a lot of time creating a very unique podcast. It's over two years old at this point. Um, 
we wanted to make something interesting and new, not just the same true crime podcast that you're hearing over and over again. So it's a very different setup than anything you've ever seen before. And we're both really proud of it. And it is a lot of fun and you learn so much on that podcast. We just dropped our episode for January. We post every first of the month and it was on most bizarre hiding places for criminals. So basically every month we pick a topic and we've done so many different topics. I'm just gonna read a few from here. We have criminal athletes, craziest evidence, shady siblings. We've done disorderly dads, murdering mother-in-laws, birth year crimes from my birth year and John's, Valentine's Day crimes, Santa Claus crimes, Craigslist crimes, um, Florida man, criminal doctor, stolen on the 4th of July, craziest costumed criminals. Like we've done the most out there random crimes and we each have to find a crime within that topic. So you hear two different stories each episode and it's basically a competition. And at the end of the episode, you get to decide who did the best research, brought the best story, told the best story. And then at the end of the year, we have like a finale where we do all sorts of fun stuff. We have special guests and um, we've had some absolute Absolutely crazy ones okay all I'm gonna say is I had someone from Harry Potter congratulate me last season when I won and it's just a lot of fun you guys and I think you would really enjoy it and I want to draw a lot more people over there because it's such a fun different atmosphere that brings me a lot of peace it's not as heavy um, and we kind of just joke at all of the ding-dong criminals out there we don't talk about a lot of murder it's just bad criminals basically and bizarre criminals so this most recent episode is like hands down one of my favorites I absolutely rocked the story you guys so so definitely go over there and show a little bit of support and vote for who you think is the winner. But now I'm going to go ahead and go so I can get myself a little bit of lunch. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that hopefully we can bring them home together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.